everyone. Thank you so much for coming to Data Driven Collections uh, patron and Patron Management, the new library science. I'm Monique Manjan. I'm the project manager for sales data and library data at BookNet Canada. And I am really thrilled to be joined by four incredible library staff um, from across the country who are here to talk about their data initiatives and other projects. Um, so I'm going to introduce our panelists. When I say your name, if you could raise your hands so they know which one of our fine panelists you are. Um, Jesse Bach is the Bibliographic Services Manager at Marigold Library System in Strathmore, Alberta, where she oversees the purchasing, cataloging, and processing of library material for 36 libraries. Before entering the public library world, Jesse worked in a number of environments, including public and academic archives, special collections, and records management. Uh, Maria Cipriano is a senior collections specialist at the Toronto Public Library and is responsible for adult digital collections, including ebooks, digital magazines, and other streaming services. She has over 25 years of collection development experience in public libraries and is a keen advocate of digital collections. Maria is also actively involved in staff training and community outreach. Janet Horn is a librarian and IT professional who has been working in libraries for 30 years. Her current position is manager of IT at the Vancouver Public Library. And last but not least, Michelle Saw holds an honors Bachelor of Arts, a Master of Information degree, a teaching certificate, and a certificate in public library leadership from the Canadian Urban Libraries Council. At MPL, Michelle is responsible for all public, technical, and virtual services departments where she relies heavily on data and evidence-based decision making to achieve the strategic goals of the organization. So welcome to all of you. I wanted to start um, by asking, um, there's sort of some interesting things. We know a lot more about libraries now than I think we ever have. We know that 40% of Canadians are using their local library every month. Um, but I was wondering, sort of, what are some of the goals that each of you have at your libraries? What's your mission? Our mission um, at Markham Public Library is to make sure that we uh, provide content to our community that transforms their lives. That's our high-level mission. We're very uh, customer. We have a very customer-centered uh, collection, so we take a lot of um, uh, community surveys, community focus groups. Um, we look at. Uh, detailed usage statistics, socio-demographic statistics, really to get at the needs of our community and to make sure that we're providing uh, digital and physical materials that meet those needs. Um, Toronto Public Library, very similar mission, um, free and equitable access to a wide variety of materials, um, also to be an inclusive environment. Uh, my personal goal as the digital selector, I, I have an unofficial title. I see myself as Toronto's ebook goddess. So my job, in my opinion, is to spark reading joy um, in Toronto and staying on a budget, which is not that easy to do. Um, at Marigold, our, our sort of yeah, high-level mission is to cultivate a collaborative library community that supports a range of responsive quality library services. So we actually kind of act as a a cooperative that has um, member libraries who are all independent organizations at the same time and we provide um, services like collection development and IT support and uh, lots of other things. <laughs> um, personally and as a bibliographic services department we really want to ensure that libraries receive relevant and in-demand material in a timely cost-effective manner and that we're providing good customer service. Um, in order to do this, the biggest sort of data points that we analyze would be circulation and holds data to inform our selection and purchasing and to place materials in um, the libraries where they'll be used the most. So um, uh, going last, I get to say ditto. Um, <laughs> the uh, pub public libraries generally have many of the same goals and um, missions that are reflective of each other because uh, we, we all see the similar values for our libraries in our communities. Um, I guess what I could add uh, to that um, from our point of view, but probably not uniquely from our point of view, is that um, we are interested in growing um, our our new collections we're interested in growing our diverse collections we're interested in changing with our community um, and making sure that we are reaching um, everybody or that we have something for everybody in our community and um, certainly Vancouver is changing demographically 
greatly, and it's also growing. Um, there's, a, there's going to be huge growth in Vancouver, and lots of, lots of additional housing in much smaller spaces. So another thing our library is thinking about is our presence as the third space where we can introduce people to books and reading and other experiences. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a few of you mentioned um, looking to develop your collections, especially your diverse collections, to meet the needs of your populations. Um, what are some of your biggest challenges in accomplishing that mission? Well, definitely um, budgetary constraints. That's just like uh, always a library thing, it seems like. Um, so you always have to look at what you have to spend and how you can um, make sure you get sort of that most hot and popular and bestseller material while also maintaining some depth within your collection. Um, I buy digital material, and what I'm finding is um, the demand is growing so quickly, and the pricing is a, a lot, it's a lot, they're a lot more expensive than print. So now what we're finding in our organization is we, the customers still want all formats, so we have to buy print, regular print, large print, uh, books on CD, uh, e-audio, and e-books. It's really a challenge to be able to buy the books in sufficient quantities. And with digital books, there's other complications. Not, not only is the price point much higher, but the content expires. So our customers are used to a fairly high level of service. They expect that you know if we have you know, book 10 in the series, we're going to have book one through book 10. And that means every year, every couple of years, we have to go back and rebuy the same books over and over again. And it becomes unsustainable as time goes on. So I had a quick look uh, yesterday to see where we were with our repurchasing. And we've, um, as of yesterday, we've spent double on repurchasing old material, um, same time last year. So it becomes more and more problematic as you struggle to purchase the, you know, the latest bestsellers, um, indie titles, and, um, and your budget is being stretched so thin. And in you know, Toronto, uh, we uh, circulate more ebooks than any library in the world, library system. So we are ranked above New York City, um, uh, LA, the state of Ohio, the state of Wisconsin. So I have a lot of pressure to deliver the goods and stay on budget. I could follow up on, on a couple of those points. I mean, certainly the, the budget issue is, of course, one of our challenges as well. Um, and it was brought home to me very clearly uh, the question of having to buy in multiple formats and then potentially having to rebuy the electronic over and over again. Just the other day, um, Monique shared with us the bestseller list, the most recent bestseller list, uh, following a, a conversation we had prep in preparation for this panel. And so I went in to check and see, uh, you know, what the performance of those were in our library collection. And for every single title, we had like five formats. Uh, whereas previously, in, in the good old days that I can actually remember, okay, we won't call them the good old days, but in the <laughs> old days that I can actually remember and due to the length of my career, we would have one format. Um, we, now we've got, we've got the print book, we've got the large print book, we've got the, C the, CD, on, the CD audio, we've got the e-audio, oh, there's more than five, we've got the e-book, and sometimes we've got two or three different copies of the e-book because we're still playing between uh, different e-book collections and vendors um, trying to identify the best match there for our library. So it's challenging. I, I echo all of the concerns that I've already mentioned, but I also have, um, just to add on to it, a little bit of more philosophical concern as well. Just as we go, as we go into, the, into the future and digital becomes more and more popular, um, print, print we know is very popular still, but digital is, is increasing year over year, um, quite, quite large, quite um, by huge jumps actually. We've, we have a 50% growth over last year, and every year we see a 50% growth at our, at our library system. My concern is because of the expense of digital materials, you're losing the breadth, you're losing the varying viewpoints, you're losing, um, you know, there's lots of hot topics in, in society today, politics, um, you know, Ill, every, everything, and you're not getting, if you're only getting the best sellers, you're not getting all the viewpoints that are out there. Um, so that, that's my concern for the future. Um, Absolutely. It was funny, we were talking about this last week and I, just after I hung up from our phone call, I saw this tweet that a journalist posted saying that 
you know, if you run out of your free articles from the New York Times and the Globe and Mail, the sites that have free access to all are often alt-right publications, and it really limits what people have access mm. to read when they're trying to do research on current events. And when you talk about how it's limiting the breadth of the collection, especially bringing in diverse voices, do you think that could have a similar effect, the way ebook pricing models are affecting your ability to rebuy all the books in your collection? I think definitely. Right now, we have a budget that only allows us to buy the, the high demand items, the best sellers. But we get thousands and thousands of requests from our community each year for long tail items, so items that are not as popular or backlist items. And we can't, given the pricing, and given the fact that they're going to expire in 12 months or, or um, after 24 checkouts, we can't afford to buy a lot of that stuff. So I think that does limit uh, the scope of our collection. Um, and it limits uh, what, what people have access to if they're looking for a different opinion, if they're looking for, for varying, varying points of view. Absolutely. Uh, at Toronto, we still try to buy as widely as possible as the largest library in Canada. If we are not buying the small press literary titles, then who is? Um, so what I'm doing is I'm just allowing the holds to get list to be a bit longer. So normally we try for a six to one holds copies ratio and I'm very generously funded um, and because ebooks have a lot of support amongst our, my directors and my um, chief librarian. Um, but uh, it, this year I've got some books that are at you know 20 to one holds ratio. I can only spend so much after I've purchased 300 copies sometimes at $60, I, I have to stop. Um, so that's where I've been, people have to wait a little bit. I try to, you know, mitigate that a bit by, you know, pushing available content at them. So while they're waiting for Becoming by Michelle Obama, I say, here's a fabulous Kate Atkinson detective novel, and I won't be happy until all of Toronto has read the Jackson Brody series. <laughs> A few of you were talking about um, other ways of improving your collections. Are you doing any data analysis with your collections to decide how, how you want to move your collections forward? And, and how are you undertaking those projects? Well, absolutely. The, like I mentioned, the biggest things that we really look at are the holds, cues, and circulation. So um, we take those numbers into account along with uh, you know, the selection expertise of the libraries in our system. So, you know, we always look at those series and authors that are popular and make sure we have lots of copies of the, the sort of the next thing coming from those people. Um, we order as much of our material as possible as far in advance as possible. So that always allows us to, uh, you know, put an on-order bibliographic record in the catalog and watch it collect holds and watch where those holds are coming from. So we're constantly monitoring that on a weekly basis, even for publications that could be coming out, you know, six months in the future, to, to see where we need to add more material or um, more material on a similar subject and which library branch to put them in to make sure they have the most use. Yeah, we're very similar, of course, in terms of the holds and the circulation, uh, very much informing us. Um, but we also, uh, as I'm sure other libraries do, allow suggested purchases. Mm -hmm. And we get an incredible range. It speaks again to the long tail and the interest that many people have in, in a broad range of topics that are perhaps less represented by the best sellers, but by what we can collect and then maintain in our collection to make available to them over a longer period of time. Time. Um, and yeah, we get a wide range of suggested purchases. Somebody wanted us to buy socks because <laughs> there was a book that came with socks. And I don't think we're going there. But <laughs> uh, socks aside, uh, <laughs> Um, we, we try very hard to respond to the suggested purchases as well as the other cues we get and our outreach librarians um, do some work in that area as well and we have teen advisory councils and so on to also help us with some of our some of our populations we need to do a much better job we want to rebalance our foreign language collections and move it uh, you were speaking about having the books in the in the area where they'll circulate. Mm -hmm. We want to move our, our foreign language collection around. We need to do a much, much better job at connecting with those communities so we can really understand uh, how and when they would use the library and which branches they would use. 
We, we're very lucky at Markham. We have a collection strategist. I think we're one of the uh, few libraries who have dedicated a position to just analytics uh, of our collection. So she does a lot of this work, and what we've noticed um, over the last five years, actually, is a, an, a steady decrease of circulation in adult fiction. And generally, for most libraries, adult fiction is, is what drives their circulation. But we've, we have a very low number. I think 6% of our overall circ is from adult fiction, uh, whereas 25% of our circ is from juvenile fiction. Um, so, uh, so in the adult area, we're noticing fiction is down, very down, and nonfiction has uh, made up uh, those numbers. And it could be as a result of the fact that a lot of our digital circ are for digital fiction, genre fiction type titles. Uh, but we'd like to get at why that is a bit more and to, to better analyze that data. We also notice in our children's uh, collection, children's fiction is very high, very highly circulating, makes up for a quarter of our circ, but children's nonfiction is steadily, steadily decreasing. Um, and I suspect that's because a lot of children are doing their program, doing their projects from just stuff they're finding on the internet and maybe not going to our lands and people collection <laughs> or um, or uh, whatever we have in juvenile, juvenile nonfiction. So we're looking to really do a deep dive analysis in both of those um, areas to make sure we understand what's going on in our community. For digital, I've really noticed, like, and I know it's in the consumer market as well, there's been a huge spike in the interest in audiobooks, especially nonfiction. Um, and uh, I found that this is my best carrot for luring men to the library. So um, <laughs> I will actually uh, go to places where people are that are not libraries and I will ambush people as they're going about their business, usually armed with a big bowl of candy. Um, <laughs> it's amazing how often people will take candy from a total stranger, especially if you <laughs> identify yourself as being a librarian, which is fairly <laughs> safe. Um, and, um, you know, I start talking up our services and what I found with a lot of uh, the male audience, which have been somewhat reluctant library users, is uh, that they perk right up when I say we have audiobooks and I buy, like it really, I watch the uh, circulation activity and the holds build on these and I've noticed that we have to buy way more books about tech or politics in um, digital audio versus ebook or uh, print. So this is something that I'm very aware of and also when I'm doing my merchandising on the, the Overdrive vendor platform, I make sure to put that stuff up there because I know they're looking for it. Um, we also use the uh, patron-driven acquisition tool in Overdrive, and I really totally underestimated the uh, thirst for uh, self-published romance, and sometimes I'm really stunned. So uh, I, I saw this one like cover, and it was a, you know, it looked like cross stitch, and it had a guy with, you know. A beard, and I'm going. Really, somebody asked for this Penny Reed, at, um, the Winston Brothers series, book one, and I go, Oh, I don't know. I don't. Okay, well, you know, it's not that expensive, so I'll buy it. Boom, like 60 holes. I'm going. <laughs> Who knew that biker brothers with beards would be a thing? It is a thing, and if you don't have it in your library collection, buy it right now. Um, so I am totally. Every day I learn something. It's that's what makes the job fun and exciting. I always like um, try to like game the system and see how much circa I can get for as little money as I can uh, spend and uh, make my customers happy. Yeah, I thought since there were some really good stats and fun facts, I thought maybe we would do a round of like everyone's favorite dinner party fact. Um, that, that thing you share when your friends are asking you what's cool and interesting about your job. Um, I can start with mine. I've been looking at data from many of your libraries and others, and over the last quarter of last year, um, the Garfield comic books were actually more popular than the Hunger Games, Lord of the Rings, and Harry Potter combined. <laughs> I hadn't thought about Garfield in over a decade, so that was quite surprising to me. Maybe not for some of you. Um, any other fun facts? Oh, I can tell mine. Um, <laughs> my sister is uh, five years younger than I am. So as a, as a young child, I uh, had the opportunity to read her um, a book. And you know those toddler age kids and they want the same book every night. And even at what it would be, seven, um, I found the same book every night, a little wearing. <laughs> but what I discovered recently is that my sister's favorite book Good Night Moon is a perennial favorite in our library, and it has the highest lifetime circ of anything in our library. <laughs> <laughs> 
I picked out a couple, but um, one thing I love seeing in our database every year is sort of the New Year's resolution trends. So um, this year on my weekly holds report, I had one book about the keto diet pop up. So I stuck in ketogenic diet as a subject into our database and it turned out like every single keto diet or keto diet cookbook that we had had just skyrocketed with holds after the new year. <laughs> so I found that really funny. And in 2018, it was instant pot cookbooks. I think everybody must have gotten one for Christmas. <laughs> Um, at our library, we always joke that we can open a new branch with just Geronimo Stilton books and get all the circ we need. <laughs> it wouldn't do anything for the community except um, the ones who, who love Geronimo Stilton, which I do too. But um, honestly, that book is always at the top, or the collection of books is always uh, at, a, at the top every single year. And then if you throw Pokemon books in there as well, you'd be probably doubling your circ in, in no time. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Markham, a hot place to be a Pokemon trainer, I guess. Now, this may just be a Toronto phenomenon, but I've noticed that when it comes to the romance genre, less is more. So the relationship between the amount of clothing that the cover models are wearing <laughs> <laughs> will have a great impact on circ. So less clothes equals more, more circ. It's kind of a Toronto thing. Um, <laughs> Markham as well. Okay. Um, the other thing I've noticed is that girl books, girl books are dead and liars are in. So bye bye, gone girl. Nobody cares about those books. If you want to see books with lots of holds, then I, I did a list. Uh, the liar's girl, the lies we told, sometimes I lie, the lying game, lie to me, the last time I lied. So, you know, if you want to write a bestseller, just put the word lie in the cover. Do you think I, that's that related title. to our growing interest in grifters and, like, the Theranos and Fire Festival type situation? <laughs> yes, totally. <laughs> um, and, and, and TPL concurs that uh, keto is hot mm -hmm. and Instapots are not. <laughs> you heard it here first. Instant Pot is <laughs> so down in 2019. <laughs> um... So we've talked a lot about these fun facts and some of your goals and especially some challenges around particularly digital collections and those pricing models. What are some of your biggest wins over the last little while in terms of things you've learned about your library and how you leveraged those into new opportunities? Uh, I'm amazed that people will check out whatever I tell them to. So. <laughs> It's you know, the candy. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I basically have um, set up my OverDrive page to have available content near the top, and I do the reader's advisory thing because I can't deliver available copies of the best sellers. And slowly but surely, I've built a following, and that my my TPL staff picks and being t I'm it. Um, uh, it we, it got a hunt. That one collection got a, over 150,000 downloads. Um, and I have many other collections. And I find by watching, like, like looking at stats, like finding books with lots of available copies and that had high circ, and then filtering out the usual suspects, like the John Grisham, because that's all over the page anyway, and picking really good books, that I am able to uh, flog a lot of content and get free circ. And that's how we've managed to leave libraries in the US that spend a lot more money than us in the dust in the way of Cirque. So that kind of makes me happy because I'm super competitive. <laughs> Other big wins or new projects? I think at Marigold, um, one thing we've just been really working on is just keeping our finger on the pulse of um, our holds and circulation statistics you know, way more frequently and way more in depth than we did in the past. So, we're looking at, um, at data and numbers that have really always been there, but taking a little more time to sort of crunch them properly and make sure they're working for us. So really just by, yeah, just by spending a little more time and analysis on um, looking at what our patrons want and are borrowing, we've been able to be a lot more uh, sort of responsive and, and on the nose with what we're, um, what we're getting for people. And we've been seeing an increase in circulation in response. So that's been really exciting for us. At Markham, one of our our big wins over the last couple of years is just better advocacy, better advocacy for collection dollars. We had a cut a few years back, uh, but ever since then, we always put a lot of effort into advocacy, but we put even more effort. Um, we also um, asked for more capital dollars for digital collections because it was needed. Um, and because of that, we've seen a, a real increase in digital circulation. 
not only for, for our ebook platform, but for things like Press Reader that gives you access to, to digital newspapers and magazines, and also things like um, online learning, uh, lynda.com and Universal Class and all of that. So we're able to get um, much needed dollars to invest in services that our community was asking for. But the way we did that was by building the case for it, looking at data, looking at um, customer, um, customer feedback through our customer satisfaction surveys, our content strategy surveys, uh, and that all helped us to make the case to council that we needed uh, this funding. Um, I think our, our big win is uh, we have a teeny tiny amount, more borrowers now, uh, than we had uh, a few years ago, which is which is which sounds like a, how is that a win? Uh, but in fact, um, physical circ is going down, and if we weren't replacing our physical circ uh, with what we can do in in ebooks and e audio, um, we would definitely be down in our number of users. Um, and instead, in addition to um, people borrowing only print and people borrowing both, both formats, we have people that we identify as new library users through our data. We identify them as new library users who uh, have come to us for our digital content and that has kept our uh, statistics, which we rely on for our funding, um, high to say yes, we are serving the needs of the population of Vancouver and we are relevant to the citizens of Vancouver. Right, because you can have this whole set of patrons who are almost, I don't want to call them ghost patrons because they're not less uh, physical than real, <laughs> real in-person patrons, but they're patrons you may not see. You don't see them coming through your doors. You aren't interacting with them. They're not taking part in your programming in, in the library necessarily, but they're driving a ton of circulation through your, through your doors even without ever stepping foot in a library, possibly. Is that, is that true for a lot of you? Does anyone know? I'm going to put you all on the spot. Does anyone know how many of their patrons are these sort of online-only users? We, d we did a survey in 2016 where we asked um, all of, We had about, I think it was 1,400 people respond. Obviously, that's not representative of a city of uh, 3,000 and, uh, th sorry, 340,000 uh, <laughs> residents, but it was still a good number. Um, and really only 1% of those respondents said that they were only digital users. Mm -hmm. But we had 68% of respondents say that they use both. They use both digital and, and, and physical. We have worked with our vendors, our ebook vendors, our database vendors, to, um, to integrate with them in such a way that every time an online user um, logs in, it hits our database, it hits our ILS, so we're able to get that, that stat, so we know who are, who are using our, our databases as well as who's using our physical collection. And that's helped us a lot understand. Um, that's one of the reasons I think Markham Public Library is one of the only libraries that don't do automatic um, renewals or don't ask our, our customers to automatically renew their card and lock them out for, until they come into our branches, because we know a lot of them are using our online resources and may not want to come into a branch at any time. So we allow them to continue, but every time we, we have face-to-face -face contact with them or phone contact with them, we ask them to verify their address and, and update their contact information. But when you cut them off at the end of a year and make them come in, you lose a lot of customers that way. Um, that, that's what we found in the past, so we had gotten rid of that practice. I don't have a number for you, but I know there's a significant number of digital-only users in Toronto, um, and people will actually come and pay over $100 to purchase a Toronto Public Library card to get access to OverDrive because we are funded fairly well. The holds list aren't as bad as if you are accessing collections, say, in a, a consortium where they have very limited funds. Um, so they find it's worth their while for the, the breadth of collection and the depth of the collection. Also, um, you can get New York Times for free at the library. You can get um, lynda.com, which was a big lure, um, Safari books. It's amazing for any of you people who are doing um, tech or development. Um, so it's a crisis. If OverDrive goes down, I hear about it. I get frantic emails. <laughs> Please, you know, I can't get my book. And I say, okay, okay. I always say there are no library emergencies unless somebody is like on the floor bleeding, but it's very <laughs> important to people. 
but I thought a good place to close since we're in a room full of publishers and other book industry professionals that maybe don't always have the chance to go talk to their local library. Um, what are some of the things you wish publishers were doing to support you at the library? Is there certain points of data that you wish they were providing or other, other support that they could pass along to you to aid in your goals? Um, for us, I think just, um, and lots of publishers do provide this information on lots of titles, but we like to know as much as possible as soon as possible, which is, I guess, a big ask. But um, we look a lot at things like print run, um, any planned sort of hyper media for the item, uh, performance of this author, this subject, sort of past um, material. Also, some of those metadata points like uh, subjects and age groups and, and that sort of thing. So um, when we're buying so far in advance, that's a lot of sort of just what we have to go on. So as much of it as we can see, we love that. I'll, I'll say it. I probably shouldn't say it in a room of publishers, <laughs> but I'll say um, it would be great. I think libraries could be better supported by publishers if, um, if there was more work between the two of us in terms of pricing models, in terms of you know, what makes sense for you as a publisher to make money, as well as for the library to get the materials out to, to the community. Um, that would be my biggest ask. Um, everything, I would echo what, what Jesse said as well in terms of print runs and media releases and what, what's the media plan for a certain book. We do have a lot of um, sleeper hits that take us by surprise and then we have customers waiting around for a long time to get those items um, on the shelves. As a person who used to do print before, it, it's very costly to do adders. Um, you know, because you have to go back and get somebody to allocate again and get the jobber to fill them, and then it's easier if we do them in large batches. I'm lucky because with digital, I can be reactive. I can get away with buying two copies, and if it, you know, one day I, I had a fit because I didn't realize, like, this book, um, The Cuckoo's Calling, I go, who is this Robert Galbraith? I was asleep at the <laughs> wheel the night before, and... Um, you know, 26 copies got purchased overnight because we have an automatic holds topping up uh, program that tops up six to one holds ratio. And I missed the announcement that, you know, Robert Galbraith was J.K. Rowling. So then I go, oh, well, that makes sense. Cause I, oh, no, the tool is broken. You know, because it could spend all your budget. If you know, we, There's some stop gaps, but, you know, it could spend your whole budget. So um, I'm very lucky. Um, but I do remember what it was like when I had to, I had limited budget and you had to guess at how many copies you would buy and it would be based on, you know, you know, past performance of the a similar book by same author or a subject. But, you know, if that author, you know they're going to be on Oprah, if I know they're going to be on Oprah, instead of buying four, I'm going to buy a hundred right off the bat. Yeah, I can only say, again, ditto. I wait till go last so I can say <laughs> ditto. Um, the other thing that occurs to me is when you all start publishing more widely and more diversely and you know have those new voices, the library is the place that's gonna buy a lot of those materials because we have that evidence. We have that evidence that our users want to read widely and, and want to read in depth and um, that we have a range of of people. We pride ourselves on being open to everybody. We may or may not actually be achieving that in every, in every moment, but it is a goal and we, we hope, you know, we will continue to strive towards that. So um, yes, add more titles, add new and interesting titles, and we will buy. <laughs> and while I have the stage, I'm and just bring gonna... them to the public's attention. I'm going to beg you to please include accessibility uh, information on your Onyx feeds and, and sometime in the future I would like to be able to see which books have accessibility features. Um, you know, make your books accessible. Uh, the popular, about 20% of the population needs accessible books and this is only going to increase as um, a po the population ages. I myself am in denial about glasses and I'm like bumping up that text like on my <laughs> iPad all the time. I look at a regular book and I go, oh, they've made the type smaller somehow. <laughs> you know, so, you know, please bear that in mind. Well, thank you all so much for coming to our session and please thank our wonderful panelists for sharing their expertise with us today.